Good afternoon. This is Shan Dunn with Altair Global. Welcome and thank you for attending today's webinar, What Will Impact Your Global Talent Management Program in 2016? The global mobility industry is constantly changing. It seems as if new trends and new regulations that could impact company mobility programs emerge almost daily. With so much change happening so fast, how can a company know what trends will have the most impact on its talent management objectives? We want to help you answer that question. In her capacity as Altair Global's Vice President of Global Consulting Services, Mary Beth Nitz oversees a wide variety of consulting related duties and programs. One of those duties is constantly monitoring the industry for new information and new trends that may impact mobility and talent management programs. We're lucky to have her here today to share her insight on what organizations can expect in 2016. So with that said, I'd like to pass the microphone over to Mary Beth Nitz. Mary Beth? Thank you, Shan, and thank you, everybody, that's joining us today. Greatly appreciate your participation. We have a lot of information to cover, so I am going to jump right in. And the first thing we're going to take a look at are some U.S. real estate market trends. We're going to look at things that happened in 2015 and where that's going to take us in the future, or at least where we are predicting uh, it's going to take us in the future. With an unsteady uh, economy over the last 10 years, there is still some residual speculation and uncertainty about the future of the U.S. real estate market. However, given that there has been positive movement with regards to the health of the overall U.S. economy, the Federal Reserve is expected to shift their focus from stimulating the economy, and that means maintaining low interest rates, towards inflation control, which results in raising interest rates. According to Realtor.com, home prices increased an average of 6% in 2015 and are expected to continue to gain another 3% in 2016. Another positive economic indicator is the unemployment rate, which the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reported at 4.9% as of January of this year. And that's the lowest rate than the thrier, over the thrier, three prior quarters. The result of economic recovery and prolonged periods of enticingly low interest rates is that the median home price value has risen at a far more drastic rate than that of the median income. Lower interest rates have also allowed families to purchase at a higher price point. Increasing their home purchase price with little to no impact on monthly payments when compared to purchases made at a higher interest rate in years past. So if interest rates do increase as is predicted, the result to the average American may be an increase in the number of unaffordable markets, fewer buyers who are willing or able to obtain a mortgage, and a higher percentage of income being contributed to living costs. The Federal Reserve made the move in December 2015 to apply the first interest rate increase in seven years. The Federal Open Market Committee, which approved the rate hike proposed by the Federal Reserve, made clear that the intention is to closely monitor the economy and potentially make calculated increases slowly over the coming years. What this means for home buyers is that the cost of borrowing money will only continue to increase in the foreseeable future. So with a, a proposed or predicted increase to the interest, interest rate, it's largely expected that the overall U.S. housing market, which we know has seen several years of record increases, may begin to stagnate. For many would-be buyers, the appeal of purchasing is directly tied to taking advantage of low interest rates and obtaining a mortgage that may be more affordable than renting. As interest rates increase, some of the attractiveness and affordability may be diminished. According to Realtor.com's chief economist, Jonathan Smoke, healthy economic indicators will be tempered by lack of access to credit and rising home prices, which will ultimately limit housing demand and growth. And with fewer buyers in the market, home prices will naturally level set. Now, of course, again, these are only predictions and only time will tell. What is somewhat exciting is what we see as a new generation of first-time home buyers. While millennials, and those are individuals aged 18 to 34, have largely avoided home ownership over the last 10 years, we are finally seeing an increase in millennials taking the plunge to purchase. The rate of home ownership among those aged 34 and under rose from 34.8% to 35.8%. And 
It doesn't seem like a lot, but that's the largest gain among that demographic since the second quarter of 2004. However, as I'll touch on in just a moment, the increase in home ownership among millennials in 2015 was nowhere near what was originally predicted. There's also an increase to this demographic's intent and positive outlook on purchasing. According to Trulia.com, only 65% of millennials reported wanting to own a home as of 2011. However, that number rose to 80% as of 2015. Additionally, a third of those with interest in owning a home reported intentions to purchase within the next two years. So what are some additional factors in the housing market? In addition to the increase of millennials hopefully entering the housing market, two other major demographics will also play a large role in the health of the housing market, and those are our Gen Xers and baby boomers. While millennials represented a third of all residential real estate transactions per Realtor.com, much of the availability for millennials is created due to the movement of Gen Xers and baby boomers. With financial recovery taking place, we are finally seeing the Gen X generation move up in their markets to better and more expensive neighborhoods. This frees up more affordable homes for first-time home buyers and entry-level buyers. Subsequently, many baby boomers are at or nearing that retirement age, and they're likely looking to downsize in order to reduce their financial obligations. We've long heard and discussed the challenges that are expected to come with the ever-aging workforce and the baby boomer population looking towards retirement. However, studies now are showing that the traditional view of retirement is rapidly changing. Mature workers realize that they can't, either can't afford to retire or they're not quite ready to make that big move. Therefore, many are continuing to work past the standard retirement age. Others are semi-retiring, and that's by shifting to part-time roles or taking consulting contract jobs, especially in areas where the gap between supply and demand for talent is increasing. So for organizations, this shift can be both a blessing and a challenge. On the plus side, changes in retirement patterns can help avoid or defer that baby boomer brain drain that has been looming. Organizations now have a fresh opportunity to address the talent gap created by a shortage of trit critical skills in the marketplace, as well as the experience gap created by multiple waves of downsizing over the past decade. Now on the minus side, shifts in retirement have the potential to increase payroll and benefit costs and may even disrupt the talent pipeline. There has been a well-accepted concern that older workers are less mobile than younger workers because they have established roots in their community and a good bit of equity tied up in home ownership. This has contributed to the need to continue to provide some sort of home sale benefit for relocating employees. However, according to multiple business reports and related research, the number of renters who are 65 or older will reach 12.2 million by 2030, and that's more, double, more than double the level in 2010. While the millennial generation born after 1980 has driven demand for apartments in recent years, baby boomers, and those are individuals born from 1946 to 1964, are expected to be the next wave of renters, thereby pushing up rents and spurring construction of more multifamily housing. So while millennials may be more interested in home ownership, the quote-unquote desired millennial lifestyle is driving significant change with regards to what we consider traditional housing. Millennials in general are attracted to low maintenance, amenities that are close by, and hassle-free living. So as I mentioned earlier, um, early in 2015, Realtor.com's chief economist, Jonathan Smoke, predicted that first-time home buyers would increase during 2015, and that this would be due to the millennial population reaching the age range when people historically purchased their first home. However, statistics showed that the millennial population did not choose to purchase homes in the numbers originally predicted more often than not, simply because they didn't have the money to do so. So with this, the renter population has continued, continued to increase, and there has been a growth of another innovative living arrangement, a term that anybody that spends any amount of time watching HGTV will be familiar with, and that's the tiny house. Sometimes called micro-dwellings, these tiny homes are attractive for many reasons, not the least of which is affordability. They also offer the attraction of not taking up more space than necessary, or paying for rooms and square footage that then need to be filled with more and more furnishings, all equaling greater expense. 
This way of living also supports the overall millennial existence of reduced environmental impact and a healthier lifestyle. So take into account all of these trends. It's expected that the view of home ownership will continue to evolve. Older employees may continue to re retain homes to maintain a home base or to allow extended family to reside in the homes, which could potentially involve a reduction in the number of home sales companies will experience. This continued trend toward urban living and renting may also result in fewer relocating employees choosing to purchase a residence in the new work location. However, companies must be prepared to provide innovative solutions and assistance in lieu of the traditional home sale and home purchase programs. The use of big data will be critical with regards to predictive analysis and the ability to provide flexible programs for employees related to home sale, home purchase, and home rental. Predictive analysis is the practice of looking at historical as well as recent and sometimes real-time data to forecast what might occur in the future. Companies will need to closely track the number of employees who sell and ultimately purchase homes in conjunction with relocation, as well as tracking this data against the ages of those employees to identify trends within individual organizations and individual generations. The use of this data will help to drive future policy enhancements to support the changing needs of a global organization's workforce. As noted, the definition of a home continues to evolve. The increase of younger employees moving towards a minimalist lifestyle and buying these micro dwellings or tiny houses might require employees to revise approaches to the concept of mobile homes as well as the traditional approach to shipping household goods. In many cases, these micro-dwellings are on wheels and or attached to a trailer, making them easy to relocate. Rather than disposing of their residence, packing up goods, and setting up a new residence in the new work location, homeowners of, homeowner, owners of micro-dwellings may opt to simply move their home, driving it to the new location with its contents intact. This will force companies to revamp policies in order to provide support and assistance with this type of physical movement. This will be seen as more of a self-move in a sense. However, as the self-move benefit has historically been something offered more to entry-level employees versus executives, it may be necessary for companies to consider a wider application of the self-move benefit. Finally, as a result of the potential trend of older generations moving towards more urban, hassle-free lifestyles, Companies would be wise to be prepared for an increased number of employees looking for home maintenance support. Employees nearing retirement age who intend to eventually return to their home base will likely not want to dispose of the residents in that location. In order to retain these employees, companies will want to incorporate some sort of home maintenance and property management benefit into their mobility programs. So I believe it's time for our first polling question. Yes, Mary Beth, I'll get that pulled up for our audience. So our first polling question today, and this is pulled from some recent surveys that Mary Beth has uh, done and looked at, what percentage of HR executives believe annual performance reviews don't accurately reflect employee contributions? Your choices are 25%, 47%, 77%, and 90%. We'll give everyone a minute to vote here. King Mary Beth, it looks like uh, most of our audience members at 53% chose 47, with 26 choosing 20, 26% choosing 25, and 18% choosing 77%, and then only five chose 90. All right. So I believe uh, we're moving on to talent management and analytics, and I. I think you'll have some info tied back to that polling question in there, if I'm not mistaken. I absolutely will, and uh, I think those polling results are very interesting, and I think you will as well once you hear the actual answer and where that comes from. So the first thing I want to talk about here is diversified talent management. And talent management, as we all know, is a term that we've heard a lot within our industry over the past several years. But the nature of talent management has changed dramatically since its inception. The talent management practice has diversified so that organizations have the opportunity to manage their talent in a lot of different ways. The younger generation of employees has become a big part of the workforce, bringing with it a revised set of attitudes and work preferences. With this generation has emerged a greater focus on organizational justice and social responsibility, and that's led to many employers incorporating these ideals into their corporate cultures. 
In addition, our understanding of how to engage with employees has grown and expanded, thus affecting the way that employers manage and retain talent within their workforce. Organizations are recognizing the need to focus on culture and dramatically improve employee engagement as they face a looming crisis in engagement and retention. And as a result, many companies are replacing those traditional performance management strategies with innovative performance solutions. One of the biggest issues that we see is an issue and a struggle with leadership development and succession planning. Companies are struggling to develop leaders at all levels and are investing more and more in new and accelerated leadership models. To address the challenges they're facing, companies are actively exploring new approaches to learning and development as they confront increasing skills gaps. So overall, where we might have seen organizations previously spending a good bit of money on recruiting, organizations are now increasing their spend more on training and development as well as performance management and succession planning. And so now we'll get to a topic that I find incredibly interesting, and that's the topic of the annual performance review. In August of 2015, General Electric became yet one other high-profile company to do away with the traditional annual performance appraisal. There has been an ongoing dialogue among HR professionals about the usefulness, or lack thereof, of traditional annual performance appraisals, as well as the search for alternatives. Other companies that have ditched the annual performance review process include Accenture, Microsoft, Adobe, Gap, and Medtronics, just to name a few. According to research by CEB, a best practice and technology insight company, managers reported spending an average of 210 hours a year on performance management activities. And here's where I'm going to give you an answer to that polling question. At the same time, 77% of HR executives don't believe that reviews accurately reflect employee contributions. The general feeling from companies that have done away with these annual performance assessments is that annual reviews can actually sometimes set up a very uncomfortable dynamic in which one person is the judge and jury for the other. They can also put employees on the defensive and potentially result in worse performance, even for star employees. So of course this transition away from the annual performance appraisal is sure to provoke new questions. Without an annual assessment, how can employers document employees' progress so that managers can objectively hand out promotions, pay raises, bonuses, etc. According to Jason Averbook, CEO of TMBC, a global provider of engagement and performance solutions, we need to document performance on a more frequent basis than once a year when managers can't remember what their team members did at the beginning of the year. And I can't imagine that there's any of us on the phone that haven't said that at least once. Companies that are moving away from the annual performance review have adopted this new way of thinking and managing by implementing processes whereby employees receive timely feedback immediately following assignments and setting up systems that support check-in based approaches to performance management. So basically, it's the concept of more frequent check-ins and more frequent conversations with employees regarding their performance. Another topic we want to address today is the topic of employee onboarding. Successfully recruiting and attracting top talent clearly involves significant time, company resources, and human capital. Again, talent management is a topic that's been on the front burner in the mobility industry for quite some time. But while we've consistently focused efforts on attracting and recruiting talent into the organization and or into key positions, are our efforts wasted if the in-house onboarding and orientation process does not provide the talent with the tools needed to succeed? Almost 40% of the respondents to Altair's 2015 Destination U.S. Momentum Productivity Study stated that concerns over job training and employee onboarding have a high impact on their productivity during a relocation. New employees, whether they are new hires to the organization or simply new to a department or position or office, are faced with the challenge of acclimating to a potentially new culture and environment while also coping with the demands of a new job. With this, the goal of every organization should be to effectively integrate new talent into the existing culture and clearly define the company's critical success factors. One mistake we see companies make a great deal of the time is hiring a new employee and then not maintaining sufficient communication with the new hire in the weeks between acceptance and the first day on the job. And interestingly, when I was up in New Jersey just a week ago, I spoke with 
a mobility manager from a large pharmaceutical organization. And interestingly, she shared with me that they have just started an initiative internally to look at how they are treating their new hires during this particular time frame, the time frame between when the job is accepted and the employee's actual first day on the job. I thought that was pretty interesting. So what are some solutions? One solution is to invite the new hire in as soon as they accept the job offer. The time between job offer acceptance and the first day can be used to strengthen the employer-employee relationship and get a jump start on required HR tasks. So are there maybe forms or documents that can legally be completed before an employee's first day? Maybe there's the opportunity to offer the new hire the, the uh, opportunity to complete these documents ahead of time. If your company uses onboarding software, many of these tasks can be done from home without paper or pen. And this can free up the new hire's first day to include more exciting and engaging activities than just HR paperwork. Beyond paperwork, organizations can bridge the gap with creative welcoming gestures. Some ideas may be a welcome card signed by future coworkers in the mail, or an invite to a company after work social. Even a quick, quirky welcome video shot with someone's iPhone can go a long way to elicit excitement from a new hire before they start their new job. The next pitfall that we see companies falling into occurs on the new hire's first day on the job. The last thing an organization wants to do is have the new hire's first day and potentially their first week characterized by a mishmash of ad hoc meetings and supervisor drop-ins. A written training schedule sets expectations both for the organization and for the new hire. It provides context and confidence for new hires as they are able to see the big picture and anticipate how best to manage their free time. It also reflects well in the organization in that it illustrates thoughtful planning and adds transparency to the onboarding process. Now a training schedule can cover the first few days, first few weeks, or even the first few months of an employee's job. The length will vary based on the unique needs of the position and the organization. The important thing is that it's designed to be accurate and useful. Otherwise, the schedule will confuse new hires, the exact opposite of its intended purpose. With that said, building an efficient and effective onboarding process is not enough on its own. All of the key players in the process must understand the role they play and the expectations that come with that role. Just as an added step, companies would be wise to consider leveraging onboarding efficiency to provide opportunities for both work and social interaction, i.e. playtime. This approach balances, balances the two important metrics of time to productivity and employee turnover rate. And again, according to Altair's 2015 Destination U.S. Momentum Productivity Study, one-third of respondents indicated that adapting to the new work environment from a social and cultural perspective also had a significant impact on their work productivity. So we'll switch gears for just a quick moment and talk a little bit about today's expatriates. And this data comes to us from the 2015 National Foreign Trade Council and Cigna Global Mobility Trend Survey. It provided some interesting insight into the expatriate profile most common in the current market. The expatriate population overall is growing older as Generation X enters its peak earning years and baby boomers remain in the workforce longer than did previous generations, as we already discussed. Additionally, fewer expatriates have children or a partner, and if they do, they're more likely to leave them at home, and that's likely due to the increase of expatriate movement into remote and what we might call hardship locations. Now, in 2015, the majority of expatriates were still male versus female, 81% male to 19% female. As you'll see there in the graph, it shows the percentages of ages of expatriates, and you'll see the largest one, 31%, is represented by expatriates aged 45 to 54. The smaller percentages are representative of the younger generations or younger ages, 28% 35 to 44, and only 14% 25 to 34, which is that uh, millennial generation. Now, some of this could be attributed to the fact that millennials going out on international assignments may not be moving out under the traditional costly and expensive expatriate packages. They're more likely to move on these more short-term developmental assignments, and so that may be why that age is a little bit lower and the percentage of that age is a little bit lower. And finally, although most expatriates do still hail or originate in the U.S., those numbers are down 10% from just two years ago and down 24% from back in 2001. And a likely factor behind this is globalization, as more companies have operations and therefore local employees abroad. 
This change may also reflect the ongoing trend towards utilizing fewer expatriates from the U.S. due to cost and great taxation considerations. And I believe at this time we have our second polling question. Yes, we do, Mary Beth. <clears throat> Pardon me. Get that launched for everybody. So our next polling question on the afternoon, how many companies integrate global mobility with talent acquisition and learning and development? Your choices are 16%, 30%, 55%, and 72%. We'll give everyone a minute here. All right, Mary Beth, here's our numbers. It looks like we have 47% of the audience choosing 16%. 42% uh, of the audience chose 30 and tied at five apiece for 55 and 72. So let's go on to our next topic, which would be service delivery models, and maybe see uh, what those polling questions tell us about that. Right, and I will say that uh, our, it's, it's very clear that our attendees on today's webinar are incredibly intelligent. Either that or the majority of you looked ahead into the slides to find the answer. So if you'll see on that chart on the, uh, on the slide we're looking at right now, this is from Deloitte's Global Mobility Insights Report 2016. And this is in regards to the structure of the global mobility function within an organization. 45% of respondents to this insights report describe their global mobility practice as adequate in global deployments. And as you'll see there, we asked the question regarding the percentage of companies that integrated global mobility with talent acquisition and learning and development, and that's just 16% based on Deloitte's report. So we continue to see increases in mobility volumes year over year. The biggest driver behind this continued growth is corporate expansion. Nearly half of all companies that responded to the 2015 Atlas Van Lines Corporate Relocation Survey reported that some form of expansion and that may be new facilities, new territories, or international expansion impacted relocation volumes. This is significantly higher than what was reported in 10 out of the last 12 years. Additionally, while we've heard a lot about the decrease in the number of traditional expatriate assignments, when we look at the effect emerging markets are having on global mobility, this decrease can seem more of a myth than an actuality. According to Mercer, the rise of emerging markets ensures that traditional long-term assignments supported by a comprehensive benefits package are not at all disappearing. The ongoing search for commodities and low-cost manufacturing destinations leads companies to more hardship locations. And so although a costly expatriate package might not be justified for a move from, say, London to New York, an employee relocating with family from London to Angola justifiably expects comprehensive support. Furthermore, a new generation of expatriates is coming from those emerging markets. The global war for talent leads to new assignment patterns and a frantic search for talent. Instead of being about relocating American managers to super, supervise operations in China or Brazil, the new face of expatriation is increasingly about how to find engineers with the right skills in Kazakhstan and move them to projects in Africa or relocate talent from India to support operations in Indonesia. So with this global expansion and movement of companies into new markets, the need for experienced and knowledgeable on-the-ground support is critical. Coupled with the trend towards local and regional needs is the focus on operational excellence. Operational excellence is critical to run mobility activities efficiently and compliantly, but also to enable mobility teams to manage company risk and reputation a broader range of mobility types, and free them up to provide more strategic advice and support. We're expecting to see more operational responsibilities moved to shared service centers or moved to be performed by maybe one or two individuals who perform this role 100% of the time, day in and day out. We're also likely to see closer integration with HR systems and processes as operational activities become more automated and streamlined. Leading organizations are building centralized, global, and sometimes regional centers of excellence for mobility. Activities conducted by these centers of excellence include being, one, a true mobility partner to the business, policy development, aligning with colleagues from talent, resourcing, tax, and finance to provide a more integrated service to the business, partnership and alignment with supplier partners, 
and overall reporting on return on investment to drive continuous improvement. So as the focus on operational excellence and real-time local support increases, so will the need for technology to support the ongoing management of mobility activities. Timely communication and real-time data will continue to be a critical service objective for organizations and supplier partners alike. In-house mobility knowledge for an organization and expertise with, among that organization is not always something that a company moving into a new market can develop quickly. Adding internal resources in new markets to match mobility activity can also be costly and difficult to manage. Outsourcing global mobility support and supplier management to local and regionalized supplier partners can deliver both the expertise and scalability needed for a successful global mobility program. Ensuring that the necessary resources are in place may involve an increase in partnerships with suppliers that have more focused concentration and expertise on a local and regional level versus global partnerships with global suppliers. So really what we're talking here is potentially a tri-regional, host-based, needs-based outsource service approach that provides the support needed for an organization that is seeking local expertise coupled with centralized management over the global mobility function. Organizations are always going to need somebody to facilitate the practical aspects of mobility, overseeing the sourcing of host location, housing, and schools, tax and immigration, and making sure that other compliance issues are handled properly. Tri-regional service delivery ensures that supplier resources are in place to support and partner with an organization's regional service centers. The overall centralized management of the mobility program ensures consistency as well with regards to processes, policy application, and service levels. So let's talk about the basic premise of a needs-based service delivery model. And the premise is that the needs of the global employee is more important than determine, in determining the support provided. A needs-based model is based on the concept that employees and their families receive appropriate and relevant support and assistance, not just the services for which they are eligible or for which they qualify. This type of service is best provided in partnership with suppliers with local expertise and knowledge who understand the nuances associated with moving into new and sometimes remote markets. Again, the use of technology to support this tri-regional, host-based, and needs-based service model is another step towards operational effectiveness. It will become increasingly necessary to implement technology solutions that promote integration and synergy between the RMC and other company providers to create a more holistic and seamless experience for employees and to create process efficiencies for the company's overall mobility team. And I believe we're on to our next polling question. Right you are, Mary Beth. This polling question talks about the changing assignee population. So I launched that for everyone. Price Waterhouse Coopers forecast that the assignee population will increase by what percentage between 2012 and 2020. Your choices here are 20%, 35%, 50%, and finally 80%. All right, Mary Beth, looks like our numbers are in. It looks to me like 28% of the audience went with 20, 44% went with 35, 22% went with 50, and that looks like 6% uh, went with 80. So let's move on to our global, cure, global security preparedness topic and talk about those numbers a little bit. All righty. Thank you. So multinational organizations continue to prioritize employee safety and security as a moral, legal, financial, and reputational obligation. So looking at our last poll, given the growth of assignee populations, which is forecasted to increase by 50%, from 2012 to 2020, and that's based on PricewaterhouseCoopers Talent Mobility 2020 study. Corporations must understand and appreciate the business impacts of natural and man-made security threats, demonstrating leadership and commitment to their employee base by taking a comprehensive approach to managing these risks. Achieving risk management success in the context of global business travel and global assignments is an extension of duty of care, and that's a topic we hear a lot about. It's a social responsibility and also a recruitment tool. A responsible global strategy draws prospective employees to the organization and attracts current employees to new roles and potential global assignments. 
We expect that in the coming years, we're going to see an, an increase in cross-functional stakeholder engagements in which those offering subject matter expertise in travel, mobility, risk management, security assessment, evacuation services, and other relevant, comp relevant competencies will collaborate more and more to ensure the goals and objectives of senior leadership are given priority throughout the organization. To the extent that these experts cannot be identified internally within an organization, corporations are expected to more frequently seek external partners to help manage their responsibilities to employees and to their employees' accompanying families. Gapping the corporation's current state versus preferred state includes identifying threats, assessing risks, and implementing tools, suppliers, and policies in order to minimize control and preferably eliminate risk. So let's talk about increased diversity and mobility. The lens of the traveling assignee and the, the lens of traveling assignee safety has and will continue to shift from seasoned business travelers and other global professionals to an increasingly diverse population of employees engaged in global mobility for equally diverse business purposes. Consider a recent college graduate hired into a multinational organization for a specialized skill and immediately deployed from his Eastern European home to the United States for a two-week corporate assimilation exercise. Comparatively considered a tenured U.S. line worker selected for a three-month new hire training initiative in a Middle Eastern assembly plant. Now traditionally, traditionally, both of these employees would receive assistance and advice regarding essential travel arrangements. However, in tomorrow's multinational corporation, these employees' aptitude for situational awareness, their accessibility to information about emerging situations, and their opportunity to provide timely feedback about how to improve the assignment experience will become commonplace. Future assignees will also benefit from the rise of consumer empowerment, taking shape in virtually all aspects of commerce and constituting much more than a hype millennial entitlement complex. The movement is a real and presumably permanent shift in the type and breadth of information available to consumers. Certainly, websites and smart device applications have been designed and largely adopted on the premise of empowering and educating the consumer. On-demand information concerning travel safety incidents, landlord and property ratings, crime statistics, etc., is already empowering employees to make sound decisions regarding their assignment travel and assignment housing. GPS technology has also become commonplace within the mobility space, whether it's used to track the whereabouts of a household goods shipment, help a family navigate the airport to a corporate apartment, or to confirm the walk score of a prospective rental property. Now, many companies have put GPS technology to work in managing other family dynamics, such as tracking the children's journeys home from school and social engagements. It's likely that similar technology would be employed particularly via corporate-issued smart devices, to track employees on non-routine travel or those traveling to moderate or to high-risk locations, thus advancing the current practice of tracking employees in the delivery and travel services space to a defendable standard corporate practice. So now I want to move on and talk about the future of global payments. We anticipate the world of expenses reimbursements and payments to continue through a global transformation over the next five years. This world is going to be altered and reshaped both by technology, regulation, changes in the global currency landscape, and evolving generations in the world of business. We're already seeing the payments market being reshaped by new types of payment providers. Business process outsourcing, or BPO companies, continue to provide alternatives to the traditional accounts payable function. These BPOs combine process rigor with leading edge technology and analytics to enable a more effective AP function. This results in greater visibility of historical and in-status documentation via document management systems. The use of these systems helps to improve the flow of information, trigger future actions, and reduce the reliance on paper and manual processes. They provide the ability for companies to customize status alerts and respond more quickly to employees when their expense report submission is not compliant to policy. Of course, we know that never happens, right? 
Currently, the U.S. and Europe exhibit relatively modest adoption of new payment technologies. I think that's somewhat interesting. But it's possibly in part because development is hampered in these locations by the existence of legacy technologies, and partly because relative and perceived effectiveness of current solutions does not motivate a quicker adoption of new models. However, by 2020, we anticipate that even the U.S. and European markets will have caught up and achieved greater alignment with other countries and markets more open to new technology. The use of alternative payment systems and technologies also helps in the area of compliance, always a critical topic for us. Costs related to noncompliance can cripple an organization if the mobility professionals are not aware of the significant and growing risks of failing to comply with tax, payroll, and immigration rules. Based on data from Ernst & Young Global Mobility Effectiveness Survey, 64% of adverse costs could have been avoided if companies had paid more attention to compliance issues. And one of the greatest compliance challenges companies face is the separation of relocation expenses from business expenses. Outsourcing the payment function can help streamline processes and more effectively separate these expenses, resulting in increased compliance. Now, one thing we have to remember is that with these technology advances and opportunities, and as we rely more on electronic receipts in lieu of paper, it's going to become more and more critical that companies define and validate what constitutes proof of payment for goods and services. Global demographics will also play a vital part in shaping the world of payments. We see developing markets are leading the way with countries such as Brazil, India, and China, home to an increasing middle class and more mobile population, where newly banked yet tech-savvy generations are more open to new ideas such as mobile expense submission. And this is fueling demand for innovative, technology-driven, and easily integrated transaction models. Some of these markets are also experiencing a rapid transition from a cash society to what we define as a cashless society. And we know that younger generations entering the workforce have really high expectations of flexibility, self-service, and efficient processes. They want it now, and they want it correct. To address these needs, many companies are restructuring programs to provide more allowance-based and or lump sum payments and benefits more aligned with the concept of individual relevance versus strict adherence to a one-size-fits-all policy with consistent benefits and provisions. The growth of new technologies will also spur changes in the area of regulation, or at least we hope. Currently, many emerging markets prevent present barriers to conducting business due to tight currency restrictions. An example would be China or Brazil. As these markets continue to grow and attract business, we anticipate a loosening of these currency restrictions, resulting in a more efficient flow of payments and funds between global markets. So what does our desired end state view of the world of payments look like? And obviously, this is a goal for our industry to aim for. It depicts a vast landscape of capabilities and added values underpinned by, te underpinned by technology. It's likely to show increasing alignment in the capabilities and expectations of companies and their service providers, high levels of integration in global payment, tracking, and reporting systems, real-time access, flexibility, and delivery of information for the end user, i.e., the global traveler or the global assignee, shorter processing and payment timeframes, and enhanced visibility in response to more uniform regulatory requirements. I believe we have one more polling question, so I'm going to turn it back over to Sham for that. Thanks, Mary Beth. Okay, everyone, our last polling question for this webinar. What corporate department or function is noted as needing to improve with regards to partnering with global mobility? Is it talent acquisition, diversity and inclusion, learning and development, or is it all of the above? Okay, Mary Beth, our numbers are in. Uh, looks like... 12% uh, chose talent acquisition, 6% diversity and inclusion, uh, no one chose learning and development, and our big majority, 82%, chose all of the above. So let's get on to our final topic and uh, see how those numbers play out. Yep. And I'm just happy to say that we obviously, again, have a very intelligent attendee group on the phone with us today, so that's great. So we want to just talk briefly about global mobility as a strategic business partner. This is something that we've talked a lot about within our industry. Sometimes we hear it termed as global mobility getting a seat at the table. 
And really what we, talk, what we want to talk about is how is global mobility partnering with some of these other enabling functions within an organization? According to, again, the Deloitte Global Mobility Insights 2016 report, we do see global mobility playing an increasing role in key business uh, initiatives. And as you can see there from the chart, 49% reported that global mobility is involved in significant, in significant expansion into new territories. 43% reported global mobility involved in formal mandates to reduce costs across the company. And 32% reported global mobility's involvement in business transformation initiatives. And that's all really good news. That certainly doesn't mean that there aren't areas for improvement. There are certainly enabling functions or departments within an organization that have regular contact with global mobility. And organizations where global mobility has regular contact with other enabling functions report that the, the greatest interaction is between global mobility and tax and that's 64% of organizations, and global mobility and overall global rewards, and that's 57%. However, there's also organizations that are show, showing us the areas for the improving, where the improvement need, is need, needed in terms of partnership, and that goes back to our polling question where the correct answer was all of the above. 14% of organizations report that regular contact between global mobility and learning development takes place. And another 14%, to get low percentages, report regular contact between global mobility and the diversity and inclusion teams within their organization. And then finally, only 25% report regular contact and inter interaction between the global mobility team and talent acquisition, the talent acquisition function. That's all we have for today. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Shan for some additional housekeeping items and just wanted to say thank you so much for all of you that joined us today and, um, and stayed with us. Appreciate your participation and attendance. All right. Mary Beth, while I'm seeing if we have any questions, I'm going to go ahead and pull up our continuing education information for you human resources credit holders and uh, CRP credit holders. Uh, here is the instructions and the ID numbers so you can submit for the appropriate credit. Uh, this information was included in the slide handout as well, so if you did not get that, please let us know in the Q&A window and we'll absolutely make sure that it gets over to you. All right, so let me go to our Q&A portion here. Let's look in our window and see what we have. All right, I'm seeing a few in here, Mary Beth. Okay, the first one, I thought we might get this one because I wasn't even sure what the term meant. Uh, <laughs> Can you please define consumer empowerment? Yep, that's a great question. Um, and actually, when we were doing the research to put together some of this trends information for our client base, that was actually a topic that I wanted to read more and more about. It was very interesting. So, I mean, in general, from a marketing standpoint, consumer empowerment is really providing consumers with options, tools, and resources to facilitate decision making. So it allows consumers maybe to tailor a product or brand experience to suit their own specific needs and desires. And by providing consumers with the power to make these choices and take actions, marketers give up control over consumer brand interaction, but the result is often that consumers are happier with the brand experience and more likely to engage with the brand in a positive way. I mean, a great example of this is Amazon.com and their consumer comments. And this equates to significant crowd intelligence that can often be more impactful than feedback from so-called experts on uh, specific products. Um, we also increasingly use social networks to provide feedback on potential purchases, trips, vendors, etc. And so it's basically before taking action or try before you buy, and that's a perfect example of consumer empowerment. The empowered consumer ideally lives on their smartphone. There's calendar, map, credit card, and a perfect example of that is using your phone to start your car or using your phone to record a show virtually or adjust the air conditioning settings on your home thermostat. And those are all examples of consumer empowerment. All right, thanks, Mary Beth. Keep on going here. Okay, I see another one. Are there still situations where renting a residence is a better investment than purchasing a home? Right. I would have expected that question as well, and it is something that we looked at and did some research on. 
So when taking into account a financial investment such as home ownership, the cost of selling and buying can add up obviously to significant expenses and even more so if you're an individual who moves or relocates often. So if we don't take into account any relocation programs that offer formal home sale or purchase benefits that may cover a portion of these expenses, research shows that given current market conditions, it takes approximately 1.9 years to break even to a point in which buying a home makes more financial sense than renting. So again, if you're talking about somebody that's relocating on a very frequent basis, it may not make sense and it may not be a wiser decision to purchase a home versus renting. All right, thanks, Mary Beth. Let me go back in. Let's see here. Uh, here's another one. Can you provide an example of a cashless society? Ah, yes. Um, so this is really interesting as well um, when we were putting this information together and going in and researching what are some of the locations around the globe today that are already considered cashless societies. And I just want to give one example. Um, and I had actually heard this um, in the past about um, Sweden in particular. Um, so, and I thought I'd share a really interesting statistic as well. The number of bank robberies in Sweden plunged from 110 in 2008 to just 16 in 2011. And that's not because security was improved, but because most Swedish banks simply don't handle cash anymore. So Sweden is a great example of a cashless society. Cash transactions in Sweden are down to just 3% of the national economy. Public buses don't accept cash. And three out of four of Sweden's largest banks are phasing out the manual handling of cash in bank, ban bank branches. And another interesting little piece of trivia that there's even a card reader at many churches if you want to donate money. <laughs> so although Sweden is probably the closest developed country to what we call a cashless society, um, there's also research out there that predicts that it probably won't be 100% there any time before 2030. So again, within the Scandinavian region, Norway is also making a transition to cashless society. Um, approximately 11% of their population do not carry any cash at all which I think I'd fit in really well because I never seem to have cash in my wallet. <laughs> okay, Mary Beth, uh, for questions, that looks like about it. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. And we've had a lot of interesting information to uh, digest today. And because we do our best to only keep you for the allotted hour, uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Just a reminder, if you're thinking of a question as we're signing off, go ahead and send it in. Go to webinar. We'll record it, and we can get to it. And get an answer out to, or get a, get the question out to Mary Beth so we can get you an answer. So just keep that in mind. And uh, before we close, I'd just like to especially thank Mary Beth for joining us and definitely give thanks for researching, compiling, and sharing all this valuable information with us and with our audience. And we recognize here at Altair Global that your time is valuable. So from all of us here, thank you for attending and have a great rest of your afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>